Hi everybody, this is Mr. Nolan, uh, and I'm creating this uh, screencast for those of you who uh, were not in today, or maybe you were in today, but you were just really confused at what we were looking at. Uh, what we discussed today was uh, how can populations change even if there's no selection going on? If there's no actual natural or artificial selection, can that population change? And what we have learned if we sort of review what we've been discussing for the last couple of days, natural and artificial selection, what we sort of decided was that, um, you know, there, there must be four conditions that are true in order for natural selection or any selection to occur. And those four conditions that have to be true, one, there has to be variations. So there has to be more than one trait. If everyone's the same, the population is not going to change. Uh, two, some variations are better than others, which is one way of saying that some Variations have a greater degree of fitness, better fitness. Um, another one is that variations are inherited by genes. The variations that uh, we look at as a population evolves are not usually random. They're not just, you know, they're, they're, they're not things that are not controlled by genes. The genes have to be influencing those traits um, so that they're inherited from parents. And the fourth principle is that not all offspring survive and reproduce. Some survive and reproduce, some either don't per survive or don't uh, reproduce. So variations, some of them are better, they're inherited by genes, and not all offspring survive and reproduce. So our central question really when we're looking at uh, our genetic drift situation is do these four principles necessarily have to hold true in order for a population to change somehow? Uh, so our central question is, is selection really required in order for a population to evolve? Up to this point, we've decided yes. So let's actually test that and see if it's true. So the goals of this investigation, the goal, is to be able to describe the role of randomness in evolution. If there's no selection, then maybe there's randomness that actually fits in here, kind of like you're rolling dice. So let me show you what you'll need, what resources you'll need in order to do this lab. One thing that you'll need uh, is the worksheet. And so I have this worksheet on my website. Uh, the links to the, 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 the web lab as well as the link to my website uh, is included in the informational section of this video. So if you're wondering where to go, click on my website. The links are there as well. If you go to my website, you'll find this, this page. It's just called Genetic Drift Web Lab. Uh, this screencast is also included on my website. Uh, and uh, you'll find that if you download this, uh, even if you can't print it or anything, at least if you download this and maybe if you save it as a file and you can work with it, um, I include the links here. And there's a little uh, informational section that you can read. Um, but uh, we're looking at several scenarios of a population in which we have uh, uh, chosen to um, control our variables and to decide will this population change even though there is no fitness uh, difference between these different traits. So this, this uh, worksheet is what you'll need to be working with. Um, and uh, once I show you the simulator, you should be able to sort of by yourself autonomously go through this worksheet and figure out, OK, I can do these scenarios and I can answer this question, how does randomness fit into populations changing? So if you go to that simulator uh, and actually, OK, uh, if you go to that simulator, to that uh, link, the virtual biology lab, uh, it even has pop gen fishbowl right in the URL. You'll find this yellow sort of notebook, and it has all this stuff here. I'm showing you the tutorial, so just click on Run Experiments, and I pause it right away. So you notice that there's a pond here, uh, and there's, uh, there's some fish, uh, some koi fish. You notice uh, that there's three different phenotypes, three different characteristics. There's spotted, there's white, and then there's red. So if you look closely, there's actually three different phenotypes that we can end up with. And those phenotypes are controlled by genes, by genotypes. Um, what combination of letters do you have to determine your genes? Now if we go, if we, if we look right at what opens up when we click on experiments, it's, you see the screen here that says experimental design. We want to raise our mortality rate and our brood size both to 15, just so that this kind of moves faster. We're also going to increase our uh, runtime to 16 times just so that we can go through lots of generations and basically simulate like a hundred years have gone by and we're going to see if this population changes. But let's look at where it says two data here because this is the really important screen. You control things over here but you can watch what happens in the experiment right here. The important graph to look at here is down here where you see this, this uh, triple bar graph. You can see that these genotypes, little r, little r, big r, little r, and big r, big r, are all represented in this graph. You might remember those from freshman biology, where we talked about uh, you know, homozygous 
recessive, homozygous, dominant, and then heterozygous. As long as you have, normally, as long as you have one big letter, you'll be dominant. But this is a weird gene set of genes because actually if you get big R, little r, you're spotted, which actually means that it's called a codominant trait. But that's kind of, you know, that's some extra information. Uh, this is the graph we want to look at because according to the way that our simulator starts, we start with about 25% little r, little r, 50% big r, little r, and then 25% big R, big R. So this is how we should always start. This is how our population should always start. So when you start the simulator here, you should reflect that here. Start that with, uh, with 0.25. Uh, this one starts with 0.5. And then this one starts with 0.25. So we're just looking at what are those, what are those allele frequencies. Okay. So uh, that's where we start. And you can actually see some information up here. The other graphs don't matter very much, but this is the one that's important. So if we go back to design, uh, and if we could click uh, play and we let this run, so let's speed it up really fast, and then we go back to, to data, look at how the generations are, are moving up, right? We're at 20 generations already. And we can see what our, in this case that I have run, we can see what our uh, genotypes are doing over the course of time. In this particular run, we can see that the uh, little r, little r has actually started to go down, and the big r, little r is still the highest, and big r, big r, oh, big r, big r is actually starting to increase. And as soon as you get to about 100 generations, I want you to pause it. Uh, and so we can just sort of analyze where we're at. All right, I'm going to pause. Now, look at what has happened. We have little r, little r, big r, little r, and big r, big r. We have a whole bunch of, of those, uh, these red fish, so a few spotted fish, and a very small number of white fish. So if we jump back at design, the way that the default of this simulator is set up, all of the genotypes have the same fitness. So uh, little r, little r, big r, little r, and big r, big r, all are just as good. Okay, they, there's not, one's not better than the other. They're just as good. There's no predators here trying to catch the fish. There's no diseases. There's no fishermen. There's, there's nothing here that's going to influence whether one color is better than another. So we're really looking at a trait which is actually not under selection pressure. There's no selection, and yet, this is what's interesting about my particular simulation, my scenario that I just ran, we end up with a really high fraction of big R, big R, uh, and a relatively small fraction of little r, little r, and a little bit less big R, little r. So if we look at these uh, proportions, these alleles, uh, what we can see is that the um, little r, little r is down to 3%. Big R, little r is 38, and the big R, big r is, is 60. So if we run back over here to our uh, sheet, uh, the little r, little r uh, is, is now uh, 3%, so it actually fell. So it actually went way down. Uh, our big R, little r, that actually went down a little bit, so that actually fell, at least slightly. Uh, and then our other one, the big R, big r, rose. Now that's only true in this particular scenario. If you run this at home, you might actually find that something else happens. Uh, and so if I were to run this again, I want you to run it a few times. That way you can get a sense for, for what happens if I run exactly the same situation over and over again. And in order to do that, all you have to do is, when you feel like you have collected your data, just click on Home, go to Run Experiments again, uh, come back here, oops, go back to Design, make sure everything's all back to the way that it's supposed to be, all 111, 1515, okay. Um, and if you look at your data, uh, again, we started once again with 25, 50, and 25. And so if you go ahead and run that again, you might or you might find, you might or you might not find that you actually end up with, you know, similar numbers or different numbers. So ho the whole idea is to run this a few times and actually see, do, does, does this work the same every time? Even though the selection pressures are actually the same, um, you know, what will happen if I run this, you know, several times. Okay. So um, let's actually um, look at some other scenarios here. So that's one scenario. Uh, if we run back here, what I'm asking you to do now is to actually play around with the idea of uh, adjusting the fitness. So now if we, um, let's actually, let's skip ahead to, um, let's skip ahead to three. And let's see what happens if I actually take one of these genotypes, big R, big R, and I set its fitness to 0.8. If I actually reduce its fitness a little bit compared to the others. Okay, so to do that, what I'm going to do is, is I refresh, and I'm going to go to run experiments, uh, and I'm going to bring my brood size mortality rate up. And I'm going to go ahead and take big R, big R, and I'm going to depress the 
uh, fitness. I'm going to reduce that to 0.8 and leave the others the same. Now, at this point, selection is now occurring because these two traits, little r, little r, and big r, little r, are better than this uh, big r, big r. And so by, by changing the fitness, this means that big r, big r is not as good. So if that's the case, let's see what happens if we speed this up and if we check out our data, what's going to happen if we actually reduce the uh, uh, success of big r, big r? How is that going to change? So I'm just speeding ahead here at the maximum speed. We're at 50 generations. And we can see here Big R, Big R puts up a valiant effort, but after around, I can stop here, after around 95 generations, almost 100, Big R, Big R has actually uh, sh shrunk significantly all the way down to, um, it looks like, 6%. So, uh, and then our little R, little R has actually increased a lot uh, because its fitness is actually relatively greater than Big R, Big R. So now this is a case, if you change the fitness so that one of them is greater than another, now you have selection. So it, this should make sense. This is natural selection. All that we've done is we've sim, we just simulated natural selection. However, again, the question that I want to pose to you, is this the only way that a population can change? What I just ran for you was one simulator in which uh, all three traits were regarded as equally good. And we actually saw that little r, little r crashed. Why? Was that because little r, little r wasn't any good? Actually, no. Um, this one uh, 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 statement, some variations are better than others, is actually not true of that first scenario that I just ran with you. Now, the second one that I ran in scenario three, it actually uh, is true. So we just have natural selection going on. So here's the point here. As you run through and you do this worksheet and you record your start numbers and you indicate did they rise, fell, or did they kind of stay the same, I want you to be thinking about in which cases is randomness the key driver of evolution and in which cases is selection the key driver of evolution. If all the traits are equal, then it's randomness. If you select, though, a, this trait or that trait is better, that means that actually there is some kind of selection going on. Four is a bit of a weird one. If you take big R, little r, and you depress that one's fitness, I'm curious to see if you can find out, you know, if you, if you can uh, identify what's going on there. Would we consider that really selection, or would we consider that to be random? So the, these are the sheets that I want you to work on. It's the first two pages of the, uh, the, the genetic drift lab. Tomorrow in class, we'll kind of look at what happens with our next uh, situations, the founder effect and uh, the bottleneck. You can feel free to move ahead and do those if you would like to, we're, but we're going to talk about those in person. Um, so uh, I hope that this is kind of helpful to get you on track with what it is that, you're, that I want you to be doing by tomorrow. I want you to look at this, uh, this selection simulator or this uh, genetic drift simulator and be able to kind of find out what's the role of randomness in a population. Can a population evolve uh, even though there's actually no selection pressure? Um, I want you to be able to, to talk a little bit about that and say either yes, it can change, or no, uh, it, it can't change just, just randomly. So again, our, our goal is to be able to describe the role of randomness in evolution with our central question of, is selection really required in order for a population to evolve in, in one way or another? So I hope that you uh, have some fun with the Genetic Drift Web Lab, this Koi Fish Lab. Uh, but uh, until the next time I see you, happy science.